Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graeme Hill. A.G. Fernando is the Teaching Director of Youth for Christ in Sri Lanka, where he served as the Ministry's National Director for 35 years. He and his family are active in a church that ministers primarily amongst the urban poor, and his ministry includes counselling and mentoring younger staff and pastors. A.G. Fernando is the author of 17 books, published in 19 languages. He lives on a meagre income and has rejected international and high-profile appointments, preferring instead to join Jesus among Asia's urban poor. A.G. Fernando, welcome to the Global Church Project. Thank you. In Jesus Driven Ministry, you talk about what it means to be Jesus Driven. What does that phrase mean? Well, um, what I was trying to do was to, uh, uh, to demonstrate that the best model that we have for our ministry is Jesus. And a lot of the books that are coming, that were coming on leadership, uh, were not tapping into this resource as well as they should. And I was trying to show that the example of Jesus and also the strength that he gives us is the key to ministry. Mm -hmm. And you say that Jesus Driven Ministry has distinct spiritual qualities, like service for instance. What are some of those qualities? Uh, well, um, I think the, the, the most, one of the most important things is that a person driven by this type of motivation has to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, and um, and so Jesus was uh, uh, the, right at the start of his ministry. There was the fullness of the spirit, uh, and then there is the servant servanthood aspect. In other words, a leader is one who is uh, committed to his people. Uh, the word servant has more the idea of being totally committed to your people. We like to be committed to Jesus, but sometimes not so much to our people. Mm. Uh, and so um, that's another thing, and it shows in the way Jesus cared for his disciples. Mm. Yeah, there's always a temptation for us, I suppose, to embrace power or control in leadership. But how do we as leaders more fully embrace the kind of service and sacrifice that Christ modelled for us? Well, uh, I think at the heart of it is maintaining our relationship with God. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, that I wrote Jesus Driven Ministry, uh, when I was, um, you know, just had passed 40 and I was beginning to ask myself, how can I uh, continue uh, to be as passionate as I hope I am, <laughs> uh, uh, even when I'm older? And, uh, and the thing that just kept coming back over and over again was, get back to your basics. Uh, and in fact, the book I had originally titled as Back to Basics in Ministry. <laughs> When you um, began ministry, you looked at the book of Acts and thought about what are some of the lessons for the book of Acts for leadership and ministry. What were some of the things that jumped out at you as you read through the book of Acts? Well, um, there were about two or three that were particularly significant. Mm. One was how important prayer is to ministry. Every chapter, except chapter 5 in the first 15 chapters of Acts, every chapter has some reference to prayer. And I suppose working for Youth for Christ, which is a more of an activist organization, this wouldn't come very naturally to us. So the fact that it was given so much emphasis in the book of Acts uh, made it necessary for me to take this seriously. Another thing that really impacted me was the, uh, the teaching on the sharing, uh, sharing of possessions, sharing of life, openness, uh, being open about financial things. Uh, living in a country uh, where there's a huge gap between the rich and the poor mm. and working primarily with poor people, this became one of the most important passages in the shaping of our ministry. Mm. You um, were offered at one point, a, I think, a seminary presidentship or something and decided to continue your work with Youth for Christ. Can you tell us something of that story and how you arrived at that conclusion? Um, well, uh, various of us have come over the years. Mm. But right from the start of my ministry, I felt that God had called me to Sri Lanka. Mm. And everything was determined by that. Uh, any decision I made had to be made in such a way that it won't affect my ministry in Sri Lanka. Mm. So whenever I got offers from outside, I just let it be like that. I just told mm. them, I'm very grateful that you asked me, but uh, my calling is for Sri Lanka. Mm. Yeah. You talk about Jesus Driven Ministry 
um, involving identification with people, and especially the the vulnerable and the poor and the suffering. Can you talk more about that for us? Yeah. Uh, coming from a, <clears throat> a fairly affluent home, um, from the time I was a child, I was troubled by the fact that there were so many poor people in the world. And then I began to work with them. Um, um, some of my most fulfilling ministry mm -hmm. has been in drug, with drug rehab, uh, in the drug rehab community. I'm at the moment mentoring a church of drug rehab people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I realized how hard I have to work to, to identify with them, how I have to change my thinking, how things that I think are very harmless could be insulting to them. Uh, just the language we speak. Uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka, uh, some years ago, speaking in English was considered wielding the sword. Mm. English was called the sword. Mm. Because when you talk in English, you're sort of saying, I'm superior to you. Yeah. So things like that, we had to just uh, change. We had to make a lot of lifestyle changes mm. uh, in order that they may feel comfortable with us. Mm. The Youth for Christ office, uh, had to be the type of place where they felt comfortable. Uh, I wanted to work very hard towards the, the sense that they owned the ministry. Uh, and if we had things that were beyond their grasp, they would see us as being distant to them. They would be recipients, not mm. owners of the ministry. And so we had to do things like that. Now, I must say that when we first started doing that, the, the response we got was quite uh, unexpected because mm. people were very angry. The poor were very angry. And I realized they have been treated as inferior all these years and they accepted it. Now they became Christians and they realized this is wrong. Mm. So the first reaction was one of anger. And we had to accept this anger not as a form of unholiness, but as a sign that these people are understanding their identity in Christ. Mm. Mm. And you talk about the fact that although English is your first language, that most of the time you're talking in other languages or other dialects. And what's that been like for you? Yeah, uh, at first it was very humiliating. Yeah. My education was in English from mm. the time I was like in eighth grade, everything was in English. Mm. And so I was not very fluent in my own language. Mm. And then I began to preach and minister in that language and I used to make a lot of mistakes and people used to laugh and uh, that was quite traumatic yeah. to me. But it, made, it just made me work harder and harder. Mm -hmm. I, I love music and I was trained in Western music. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach is my favorite. Uh, and then when I started singing in my language, I found that I was singing like a Westerner. Uh, after many years of, uh, of trying to learn, uh, I, I consented to sing a solo mm. in, a, in a village mm. where I had been uh, ministering. I thought the village people are less discerning. I think they, they, they can handle. And after I had finished singing and after the meeting was over, I overheard when I walked into the house of our staff worker, people are having a good laugh and they were imitating me singing uh, because they saw me singing like a foreigner. And so I went on a fast. I didn't listen to Western music for about four years, I think, mm. and just tried to immerse myself in our music. Mm. Because for some of us, those changes took a long time. Others who are very brilliant musicians, they can just keep changing as they go. Yeah, sometimes we wield power through our language and culture, and sometimes through knowledge as well. And the other day I was listening to you talk, and you, you talked about the fact that if our theology can't be understood by seventh graders, then it's of little use. Can you unpack some of those that thinking for us? Yeah, well, um, I, I really think that uh, theology is the same for young people and for children and for adults. And we have to try and communicate that. Um, I think one of the blessings of being, of living in a poor country is that even those of us who are fairly educated uh, have to work with people who are not so educated. Mm. And uh, working for me uh, with the youth organization, uh, they are quick to tell me when they don't understand what I'm <laughs> saying. So I have had to learn to, um, to bring it down, bring it down, bring it mm. down all the time to bring it down. 
uh, and make it simple. Um, and 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 so that's that's what we have had to try and do because uh, ultimately people must understand what we are saying. Mm. What have you learned about relying on the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in ministry? Yeah, that's that's something that um, I I uh, well in my case I I have often been overwhelmed by my own mm. weaknesses, my own mm. sinfulness, mm. Uh, and my own being disqualified for ministry. I never felt I was a person who was qualified for ministry. So that has made me rely on on God. And sometimes when I'm uh, when I feel weakest, that seems to be the time that God uses me. And uh, and so uh, all the time, even when I'm speaking, I'm always pleading with God. You know, I'm speaking with my mouth, but in my heart I'm pleading, Lord, please help me, please help me. Uh, and that's, I think, a nice way to live uh, because uh, relying on someone who loves us so mm. much is a happy life when you, when you have someone like that to rely on. Mm. Now, these days people live very frenetic lives, very active. Everyone seems overwhelmed or tired. Um, how do we get better at retreating, um, using silence um, and solitude as a way of recharging our batteries in ministry? Uh, I, I personally don't think feeling tired is a sin. Mm. Um, a lot of my Western friends uh, rebuke me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, rebuke me and say you're working too hard yeah. but you know living in a country like ours we don't have specialists mm. we have to do a lot of things just we, we can't devote ourselves to our particular giftedness and and trying to do that uh, to do our calling to write to prepare mm. to study plus do all mm. the personal work for me has meant tiredness mm. I would think that I have been tired I've been in ministry 40 years and I think I've been tired for 40 years. <laughs> but in, in the middle of the tiredness, I have tried very hard. I'm not a very disciplined person. So consequently, it's not easy. I don't take to prayer, to mm. solitude uh, naturally. But my theology makes me do it. Mm. Because I know that if I don't do that, I'm finished. Mm. Because it's all of God. Mm. And, uh, and if I don't spend time with God. So... I've had to just take it as a theological reality mm. that I have to spend time alone mm. with God in solitude, walking, uh, you mm. know, singing, praising God. Mm. And so that's something that I'm, I, I, I've just had to work on. And I think, um, I think a lot of people say they don't have time, but you make time for the things that are important. Mm. You know. So, what role does scripture play in shaping us as Christian leaders? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, um, I studied under a man called Daniel Fuller. I, I did my postgraduate work mm -hmm. under him. And he used to always say, if your theology uh, doesn't result in ministry, mm -hmm. uh, it's useless. And I took that to heart and then modified it a little to say that if my ministry doesn't come from theology, it is useless. So I've tried very hard in our ministry to make all our meetings theological. In other words, even our business meetings, to spend a little time, to waste a little time, talking of the ideas behind what we are doing, so that we can, uh, we can shape our ministry out of things that the scriptures teach. And, uh, and always teaching, uh, I have felt, even though I'm in an evangelistic organization, uh, my role has been teaching. Teaching people so that they can practice it in their ministry. And I hopefully also have to practice it. So, um, so I would say that this has been one of the driving forces. Mm. Teach the scriptures in a way that it can be practiced. And don't practice what the scriptures doesn't uh, give us room to do. Mm. Now, in the West, this idea has developed that if we follow Christ, we'll prosper, um, we'll have a good life, and so on. But you remind us in some of your writings that to serve is to suffer. Can you unpack um, your understanding of what that means and how the life of Paul, for instance, shows us that to serve is to suffer? Uh, you know, in, um, uh, in, this is not a, this prosperity idea is mm. not something that is confined to the West. Mm. I think the West exported it to us. Yeah. 
and it's very popular in our part of the world. Uh, so I, I, I've tried hard uh, not only to talk about the importance of suffering, but also mm -hmm. to talk about how suffering and joy mm -hmm. can be there together in our life. Um, I wrote a book called The Call to Joy and Pain. And of all my books, that's the one that got the highest award. Mm. It was given an award by Christianity Today for, for pastoral, and it was the book of the year, for pastoral and church leadership. But that's my book that just didn't sell, yeah. <laughs> even though it got an award. Because I think we haven't learned mm. uh, to, to, to understand that frustration is a part of life. I mean, I think Romans 8 is very, very clear about that. Frustration is a part of life. And, um, and if we don't understand that, we are going to be very unhappy people because life is frustrating. So I think we have to get it into our theology that we have to suffer. That's, that's part of it. That's part of belonging to a fallen world. And to learn how to be joyful in the midst of suffering. I think, um, uh, I, I hope I've not been too ju judgmental, but I, I have a feeling that maybe uh, suffering is put in one compartment and joy in another mm. and not both in the same. Yeah. So sometimes when I'm having some problem um, uh, and I, I almost get the impression from my friends, I ask for prayer, uh, that you're doing something wrong. So there is this idea if you're suffering, uh, you're, if, you're, if you're stuck, if you're having difficulties, mm. you may be doing something wrong rather than that may be a sign that we are doing something right mm. because Jesus promised that we are mm. going to suffer. Mm. Now, friendship is sometimes minimised in, in our culture and you write about reclaiming friendship and one of the things you say is that friendship is sometimes, mm. spiritual friendship is alien in our churches. Can you talk a little bit about why is friendship alien or minimised in our churches? Uh, I think individualism Mm. has become so entrenched, ingrained mm. in, our, in, our, in our whole approach to life mm. that commitment, my own feeling is that commitment is one of the features of Christianity that mm. is most difficult to maintain in today's world. Uh, every culture has some aspect of Christianity mm. that is very difficult to maintain. And I think today it is commitment. Because we are used to short-term relationships, we are a very mobile society. I, I, I remember when I was at first studying uh, postmodernism uh, in the 90s, um, uh, there was this strong uh, sense that postmodernism is looking for community, for friendship, because there has been too much individualism. And th this was long before social media came. Mm -hmm. This was in the early 90s. And then suddenly they found their answer in social media. But uh, social media is, uh, while it has a lot of good in it, mm -hmm. I don't think it is, uh, it is a very, uh, what shall I say, uh, a very, uh, uh, um, uh, you, you can hide. Mm -hmm. You can be without telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So there isn't confrontation unless it's this insulting that goes on. Mm. But there is no loving confrontation. Mm. So I think in, in, in the Bible, friendship is something, uh, I mean, C.S. Lewis has some lovely yes. things to say about, uh, about friendship, where you just sit and chat. People mm. are too busy to chat. Uh, and, um, and so I really long to see uh, mm. people restore, recovering this sense of uh, Friendship in Christ, where the things of God are so important that we just sit and talk mm. about the things of God. I think the early Christians, uh, you know, earlier Christians used to call it holy conversation mm. or something like that. But um, this is something. So in our ministry, what I try to encul uh, encourage is for our meetings to be uh, a fellowship of friends mm. so that we are united emotionally mm. as well as united missionally, mm. so that we are friends doing a work, mm. people who love each other and who are willing to be patient with each other. Mm. Why do you turn to Proverbs and Ecclesiastes mm. for resources on friendship and how do those books help you? Yeah, actually that was a, that was a most unusual thing that mm. happened to me <laughs> uh, in that I was very busy 
uh, once when I uh, agreed to speak um, uh, during a sabbatical that I had in 1988 uh, uh, on relationships in Proverbs. Uh, and I, uh, I foolishly decided, uh, said, okay. And then when the time came close, I, I panicked. Uh, mm. And then I began to just read through over and over and over again the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Uh, and, uh, and suddenly I realized, my goodness, see what it has to say. Such mm. wisdom mm. on relationships. I mean, what, what you see, uh, it's rightly called mm. wisdom literature. Mm. And then, uh, so th that's what made me write that book. Mm. But, um, um, and then when I, when I was working on a theological book for my sabbatical, I just thought I'll write this also on the side, and it was I, I wanted to give it as my legacy, as my gift mm -hmm. uh, to the West, which had I had learned so much from the West, <coughs> and I was very worried about this the superficiality of relationships. Mm. That that's how I ended up writing that book. Mm. I can see how spiritual friendship would help us in discipleship and in community, but how does it also help us as a missionary people or as a in our witness in the world? Well, one of the things I think that we have completely got out of our system mm. is the fact that mini all ministry is community ministry. Mm. Whether it's theologizing, whether it's evangelism, whether it's personal witness, it's all mm. communal. Mm. And, and, uh, and when we have friends, we do ministry uh, in, uh, in our, with, with our friends. Mm. And, and even mm. if they're not there with us, they are behind us, backing us. Right now I have a group of people who are praying for me. And every time mm. I have a problem uh, when I'm abroad, I will write to them. And I know that they are partnering with me uh, in my ministry. So B Christianity is a communal religion mm. and everything we do is communal in Christianity. Mm. Mm. I wanted to ask you a bit about sharing the truth in love. The, many of the cultures that we live in today are pluralistic cultures. How do we begin to engage in these environments better as Christians today? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think the, the whole gospel mm. is a... There are, there are certain features about the gospel. The gospel is an outgoing thing. You know, you mm. have to share it. But the gospel also... Uh, uh, he humbles us to remember that it's all of grace. And these two are so important when we think of our witness. When we go to people, we go with a sense of humility. And but because we know that we are, we don't deserve to be Christians. Uh, so this, this idea of uh, arrogance being the opposite of pluralism is, is a myth. Uh, people who are convinced about the truth uh, will be humble about it. And they don't want to push down others to be... Uh, I think fundamentalism comes more from an insecurity. Mm. When you look at the other as your enemy, whereas in mm. Christianity, we look at the other as, as somebody we love, mm. we yearn for. Mm. Uh, and so I think, um, I think that, 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 is, uh, that is our key in mm. this pluralistic society. Another, another key is that we are asked to go and be part of our communities. Mm. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are non-Christians. And they are good people, but I yearn to share Christ with them. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate them, I enjoy things with them, I visit them. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think God has called us to go in as gospel people. Mm -hmm. Gospel people love, gospel people are humble, but gospel people mm -hmm. are also passionate mm -hmm. to see them come to Christ. And what role does dialogue and persuasion play in this mix? Uh, well, um, yeah, yeah, the word dialogomai, which, which, mm. which is sometimes translated dialogue, is, um, is used mm. often in the Bible of evangelism. And I think, um, I think there are different kinds of dialogue. One kind mm. of dialogue is just conversation. We are talking about our beliefs. The, the setting may not be appropriate for persuasion. Mm. It may not be appropriate for us, you know, working Mm -hmm. And I think we must respect such environments. So, mm -hmm. so when we are dialoguing, we are not always evangelizing. But, when we, but, but deep down in our hearts, there is this desire. Mm -hmm. People need to know Christ. Mm -hmm. So we are always mm -hmm. looking for opportunities when we can dialogue in such a way that we can mm -hmm. communicate the gospel and persuade people 
that this is the way for them to follow. Mm. How do we build genuine relationships with people of other religions without, you know, because so, sometimes I think people get suspicious that the only reason, you know, Graham is talking to me is because he wants to convert mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. But how do we go about, through humility and sensitivity, developing deeper relationships? Uh, I think that's the way we relate to people in society. Yeah. You know, we have friends. Yeah. And we relate to others just like we relate to friends. We meet them on the street and ask how mm. they're doing. Mm. We care for them when they're sick, we go and visit them. Mm. And, um, and I think if, if, we, if we develop this idea, just like Jesus, he hung around. He mm. hung around sinners, uh, you know, and people were scandalized by the mm. fact that he did that. But he, it was a natural thing for him to be with these people. Mm. And when we love people, it should be natural for us to want, I mean, we are, we are very uncomfortable sometimes with what they're doing, but our love makes us go and be with them. And so I think that's, uh, that's something that we Christians have to recover. Mm. Now, you've been in ministry for 40 years or more. What is one thing that you really want to say to the church today? I suppose one of the things that, that is, I'm really burdened for Mm. is to demonstrate that the Bible can be followed. Mm. Uh, it's not easy in my own personal life, especially in my pursuit of God's ways. It has been a battle. It has been mm. a constant, it continues to be a battle. But, um, but I am beginning to see a timidity when it comes to confidence in the Word of God. Uh, there is a timidity on the part of those who are very experiential, who see the uh, see uh, Bible exposition, for example, as being not spiritual enough, not having enough power. There is a timidity on, peop on, uh, on the other hand of people who are a little embarrassed by a past history of arrogance mm. on the part of uh, Christians. Mm. Um, and and they, they just feel, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they squirm. Uh, mm. at any remembrance of that old arrogant uh, sho shoving down the word on people. Mm. So I think we need to recover that the Bible is still living and active mm. and sharper than a two-edged sword mm. and, um, and then labor to make it mm. understandable and applicable to people. I think mm. that, is, that is a labor today. It takes work, it takes time, mm. time to study the word, time to study mm. the word. So, um, so I am really um, burdened that people mm. take the scriptures more seriously and that they get more excited about the scriptures mm. because the scriptures <laughs> is, uh, it is an exciting book, the Bible. Mm. What gives you most joy in ministry? <laughs> um, you, you know, over the years, I, I, I've worked with Youth for Christ for 40 years and in our culture we have a word called bajar. Baja means your gang, your, your, the clique that you move around with. And one of the greatest things for me has been the different gangs that I've had. Mm. Right now, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing my personal ministry in my, in my church. And my gang, uh, there's one truck driver, uh, three uh, three-wheel taxi drivers, another guy who's, a, who's actually at the moment mm. in prison. Uh, he's a drug, he struggles with drug addiction, another guy who's an alcoholic. Mm. But that's my gang. Mm. And that's the, that's the group that I, I go to the beach with them. Uh, so I've always, over the years, had gangs that mm. I've been with. <laughs> People who love the Lord. This particular gang mm. is very different to the gang I grew up in, with, mm. you know, the, the group mm. I grew up with. Yeah. So, so I think uh, having friends mm. in ministry has been one of those really, really happy things because they've done so much to enrich me. Mm. Uh, I've worked with drug addicts for a long time and how much they have taught me mm. about life, about the world, things that I never knew. Mm. What's most misunderstood about the things that you say? Do, do you ever have somebody sort of um, give you feedback on something you've written or something you've said and you think, that's not really what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, uh, sometimes I'm a little grieved <laughs> mm. uh, when people uh, tell, say that I'm uh, a reproduction of Western thinking, Western mm. values in mm. Sri Lankan dress. 
um, I think I, I have uh, some of the same theological things as Westerners do. Uh, but uh, I think I have tried hard to live and work in Sri mm. Lanka. So that's sometimes a little grievous to mm. me because I affirm things that have been affirmed for a long time by Western evangelicals, for example. Um, uh, they think that I'm, you know, a stooge of Western mm. people. So that has been a little, mm. a little painful. Um, and I don't think I'm a stooge of Western people mm. because there's a lot in the West that I don't like. That I'm not, not that I don't like, I'm concerned about. Mm. And I have tried to make the West aware. Uh, but my style is not what you might call a prophetic style. I don't mm. shout at them, I don't mm. speak very. So I think uh, people misunderstand that mm. sometimes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Ajit Fernando, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. Thank you, it's been nice to talk to you. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.